Hi, everybody. My name is Katharina Mokrua, and I'm a member of the Public Education Committee for ADAA. That's the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. I'm also an associate professor in the Department of Behavioral Sciences at your college in the City University of New York. Welcome to our webinar, Depression Among College Students. And our presenters are Diana Cusimano and Erica Riva of the JET Foundation. Before we start, I'd like to say a little about a, a little about ADAA, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America. ADAA is the leading nonprofit organization in the field of anxiety and depression. Our mission is to improve the diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of anxiety, depression, and stress-related disorders through education, like this webinar, practice, and research. We work to end stigma and to get the word out that these conditions are real, they're serious, and treatable. So I want to invite you to visit our website, adaa.org, adaa.org. It's a wonderful resource and you'll find a great list of treatment providers just click on find an ADAA therapist on the on the home page um, we also have free peer-to-peer -peer online support group you can also support ADAA by making a charitable donation on the website okay so let's get started I'm really happy to introduce you to our presenters See, we have uh, Diana Cusumano, who is a campus advisor at the Jed Foundation. She worked in higher education for 12 years, gaining experience in college counseling, student affairs, and academic services before joining Jed. She is a licensed mental health therapist and a registered yoga instructor. Diana holds a BA degree in psychology from Central Connecticut State University university and an MS degree in mental health counseling from Pace University. Erica Reba is also a campus advisor at the Jet Foundation. She is a licensed clinical social worker. She previously worked as a therapist at Eastern Michigan University and Wayne State University's counseling and psychological services. Erica earned a BA in elementary education from Michigan State University and received an MSW from the University of Michigan. So now let me turn it over to Erica and Diana. This will take just a moment to get their slides up. There we go. Hi everyone, um, my name is Erica Reba and I'm a campus advisor at the Jed Foundation. Hi, I'm Diana Cusimano and I am another campus advisor here at Jed. So a little bit of a history of the Jed Foundation. Um, it was founded about 20 years ago by a family, Donna and Phil Satow, um, after their son, Jed, died by suicide while he was a college student. Um, so about you know 20 years ago, not a, some, some things were happening around college mental health, but not a lot, not as like what we're seeing today. Um, so they came away after this tragedy feeling like more could be done to address the college um, population around mental health issues. Um, so we started the JED Foundation around 18 years ago, um, and we have many different programs, um, audiences. We reach students, faculty, staff, administrators, uh, professionals, educators, um, and parents and families around these issues. Um, and our signature program, the JED Campus Program, um, we work um, with around 200 um, colleges and universities in the program ranging from private, public universities, community colleges, on helping schools think about um, how to implement and make cha bring change to their systems, change to their campuses, around policy development, um, making sure that students are supportive, having really good trainings in place for faculty and staff to identify students at risk. And um, we as campus advisors help schools on a four-year journey to help implement goals. Um, we have many other programs in our, uh, you know, at, at the Jed Foundation. Um, half of us, the Lifeline, just so, so many tools, that Love is Louder, many tools to sort of um, reach students, direct, direct youth students and um, programming and sort of ways to navigate help seeking and help giving. We'll talk a little bit more about our new campaign, Seize the Awkward, in future slides. Um, but we have just so many great resources for various audience, so we really encourage you to check out our website out after this presentation, um, jedfoundation.org. Yeah, that's one wonderful. More thing. 
great to hear. So there's so many opportunities out there. It's not, the, and there's, it, it, this is a, an issue that even though it's serious, it is, it should be viewed with some optimism because there are some really very important resources out there. Yeah. So uh, to note that in our Dead Campus program, Erica and I work with about 60 schools each. Um, so we will be discussing, yeah, we will, we will be wow. discussing as we go through the webinar today, some of the things that we see trending and some of the uh, good stuff that a lot of the schools are doing to help students that are, you know, having depressive symptoms or anxiety and things like that. So we're happy to share those things as well today as well. Um, so we are very, very, very honored to be doing this webinar and um, happy to be talking today. So what we know so far um, in our work and talking with schools is that students are coming to college campuses with more, depressi more depression and anxiety happening in their lives. Um, they're coming to campus with pre-existing mental health conditions. And, mm. and when they come to campus, the transition to college life uh, can be a challenging one if they don't have the right preventative tactics in place. Um, or maybe they don't know, um, you know, the resources to talk, talk to on campus. So there's a, there's a whole set of reasons why students are coming to campuses a little bit more um, in need of some resources these days. And, you know, and, and we can talk about other stuff that adds to that later on as we go through the, the webinar. But some statistics for you all um, that I think are helpful to see is one in five students will have a mental health condition. And I think that's a pretty high number and something that really, really sticks out. Um, so, so that's really important to keep in mind when you are working with young adults or um, they're coming into college campuses about how we can help, help them with preventative work in that area. Another yeah. one I think that's important on this slide to really look at is 60% of first year college students feel underprepared emotionally. So, yeah, so I think that's a pretty telling <laughs> uh, statistic yeah. because they feel prepared academically, but when it comes to things like adulting, right, you know, or life skills or how to, how to um, function with the transition to college life, they're really struggling there. And that's adding to their stress and then that's adding to their depression or their anxiety. So I think it's really important that we look at that. Um, and, and out of that same study, which you can find at the JetFoundation.org website, um, out of that same number of students, 54% feel overly stressed every day. So it's not, I'm not talking about a normal kind of stress, you know, when you're kind of having um, like something due for work or whatever it is, but these students are feeling extremely stressed, almost to the point where they can't function every day. So I think that's also mm -hmm. pretty telling. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another piece on this slide that I think is important to look at are, are those that are not working or going to school, but they are college age. So one in eight young adults are feeling disconnected. So, I mean, that's a pretty high number as well. And we will talk about students that are on campus, the feeling of disconnection and feeling lonely and how that also aids into depression on college campuses. Mm. Now, you, I have a quick question for you about the right. um, the rising percentage uh, in recent years of students or young adults who are coming in with mental health problems. Do you do you find that that's um, is there a reason for the increase? Do you find that students are coming in not just going to school but also juggling work or family? Are they more likely to work? Is that one of the reasons that that you might be seeing more? overwhelming as a feeling yeah so this is definitely a question that we've been looking at and speculating and you know speaking with experts about to figure out you know what is going on here um and you know amongst our our jed campuses the, the counseling centers are also seeing a very high up, uptick of students coming in for services more than any other year this year and last year particularly so they're also investigating on their campuses, you know, what is going on with these students before they're coming into college. But I think it's hard to pinpoint one thing. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of different factors and things happening in our society now and in our in our climate that are that are adding to this. Um, you know, a lot of speculation is surrounding social media and the way that students communicate to each other these days. 
And I think the, the political climate can be very stressful for many young adults, adults, um, you know, the, the, gun, the gun violence and issues going on in the high schools um, can contribute. You know, a lot of students feel very finding a financial burden, you know, feeling like they might be able to not be able to afford, you know, school or they might, might need some financial support. Um, so there's just many factors that could be contributing to students really coming in and with high um, symptoms of anxiety and depression. And I think even though there is, you know, stigma that still exists around mental health, there is more talk about mental health now. So there also might be a sense of maybe feeling a little more comfortable talking about what they're going through and getting help at an earlier age versus later on as a college onset um, with symptoms. So I think there's, this is an area that definitely is one to be continued to be studied and looked at very closely and monitored, but I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I think we're going to see continued rates to increase among mm -hmm. college campuses um, for various reasons. So, so this is another slide of statistics that we find to be really important to look at. Um, the first, the top two, three out of five will feel over, overwhelming anxiety, and one out of three will feel so depressed it will be hard to function, which are, again, very high numbers. Um, and then when it comes to suicidal ideation, you know, we are seeing more and more students that are presenting with thoughts mm -hmm. of suicide or hopelessness um, or feeling really clinically depressed. So I think it's important to really look at the numbers surrounding that. So you can see that over two million will have serious thoughts of suicide and 1,400 mm -hmm. will die by suicide. Um, so this work is very important. <laughs> uh, and mm -hmm. we, we hope that when uh, people leave this webinar, that they'll have some tools that they can put in their pocket of maybe of how to kind of help somebody that they might see maybe struggling, whether it's helping a friend, whether it's helping a student, or whether it's helping you know somebody helping their colleague's child. We hope that we can give some kind of tools and advice. Yeah, and we're really encouraging, you know, colleges to really be consistent in collecting data on, you know, where their students are. You know, how many students are really showing up to the counseling or health center with symptoms mm -hmm. of depression, anxiety, binge drinking, you know, drug use, um, the opiate, you know, epidemic. Really important to think about where where schools fit into all this. Collecting mm -hmm. um, data on how many students are having thoughts of suicide so that we can really um, understand the trends happening mm -hmm. and adapt to those and um, really Im implement some good programming and resources to, to our um, audience. So really important to do that as yeah. well. Yes. Yeah. Now I have so, a question for you with oh, yeah. regards to, um, with, with regards to, I think it's really wonderful to try to encourage counseling centers to keep tabs on their students, get to know them, their needs, and so forth. Do you also find that there is a uh, quite a bit of understaffing, or or call, are college counseling centers reporting that they're maxed out? They are they don't have enough resources to address uh, the increased need. Yeah, I think across the board, people are feeling very exhausted, and they feel that they don't have enough staff or bandwidth to really support students. Endless wait lists. We're finding, you know. And I think, you know, something to take away, I think it's really important that colleges really invest in thinking about how their triage system works in identifying mm -hmm. students who are in crisis or coming to see, you know, students who really need to be talking to someone right then and there. So really having a good system in place. Um, and I think, again, with collecting data around what, what your college statistics look like around mental health, that can really be support, a good support of data collect, you know, set to help um, fund some staffing, really showing senior leaders, um, having students like have their voice be like, be, be telling these senior leaders, these presidents, you know, we feel we shouldn't be waiting for a counselor. We think there needs to be more resources in place. And it really, the data is so powerful. It can really help um, increase staff and resources. And in addition, we also want to say, you know, mental health can, again, no longer just be a counseling and health center issue. We really uh, encourage a public health approach. So many different people on campuses really being aware of the resources, really chipping in, helping out, and supporting students when needed. So again, yes, there's a wait list. Yes, it's, it's all across the board. But we also want to think about how do we make this community-based and, and a community approach. Right, right. Like that saying, it takes a village. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we, we believe in upstream work and preventative work and really using every voice on the campus, uh, students, staff, and faculty to be really involved in looking out for each other. So. Right. right, that makes a lot of sense. Faculty members are often the first to see signs because of failing grades or or they're struggling, they're not showing up in class. So it makes a lot of sense to try to get everybody, all stakeholder, all stakeholders uh, involved in trying to talk about it. Yeah. All right, let's yeah. see. Yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, so I'm just going to dive in and talk about a little bit what is depression and not just what it looks like in students, but what, what does it look like in all of us, you know? Mm. So, um, depression is a medical condition that it can affect someone's ability to work, function, study, and interact with their families or peers, and really ability to take care of themselves. We sort of lose a sense of who we are when we're struggling with depression. So really important to note that this is a medical condition. A lot of people don't feel like depression or any mental health issues is the same pain as it is a broken leg or um, heart disease or cancer. But I think it's really important that we, we, we work to destigmatize and say, you know, mental health is also a medical condition. It's, it's, a lot of time, many people feel the same pain and depression as they do with a broken leg or, you know, you know really, um, you know, diabetes. So it, it, it takes a lot. It's a lot of pain that people are feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so symptoms can last months to a year if left untreated. You know, the first time it can last, you know, a few weeks, come back. Sometimes people could be diagnosed uh, with depression and they could have it for, for, for a long time of their lives. So it, important to know it, come, it can come and go, but really important to get it treated. Um, uh, some symptoms can be expressed through the abuse of drugs and alcohol and risk-taking behavior. Um, and we also know, you know, you know, depression can be is treatable with, um, it can be with just, just therapy, just medication, and oftentimes studies have shown the combination of both are very effective. Mm -hmm. um, we also know that symptoms can also lead to thoughts of suicide. Um, so um, again, we'll talk about the importance of how to reach out to help with those who, who are struggling. Um, and then also, you know, Something from the AU Triple C D um, data is that depression is among the top three reasons given by college students for dropping out of school. So it's really important that schools focus on, you know, these retention rates. How do we get kids to, to graduation? But we also have to identify where students are struggling, how we can help them before we reach, they reach that point of leaving school, or you know, for for good. So we really want to help students feel good and be in school, but if we also encourage students to like take time away if they are struggling with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of the causes of depression can be, you know, uh, a combination of things. One thing I think to remember and consider, like Erica mentioned previously, is that it is a medical condition, which also means there is a uh, biological factor that comes to this. So you can be predisposed based on genetics um, to have some depression throughout your lifetime, whether it's a bout of depression or you have clinical depression or different kinds of it, um, that, that can play a factor in it. Also, a whole slew of other things such as stress, your diet, um, any kind of physical illness, personal loss like grief and relationship difficulties, and also things that might have happened when you were young as a child or any kind of traumatic event. So it's really a combination. There's not, again, one thing we can say that's why it's caused, um, which I think sometimes mm -hmm. people would you know that would be helpful, but we have to look at the whole picture and somebody holistically to really see what's going on um, with them to cause their depression. So there are different signs and symptoms for depression, and we like to break it down by physical, emotional, and thinking kinds of symptoms. And what I always uh, think is helpful to, to think about when you're looking at somebody that maybe you feel something might be going on with them is if any of their behavior changes even a little bit, or maybe, maybe even like drastically, but even slightly, I would say, then really it's good to investigate and see what's going on with that person. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the some of the physical symptoms could be changes in the sleep habit, so either you're sleeping more or you're sleeping less. Um, same with appetite, maybe somebody's eating more or they're eating less. So it's really, again, any kind of change. And a big, big sign is when somebody starts withdrawing um, from mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. that they care about, from activities they used to enjoy, maybe they're no longer going to classes, those kinds of things. That's a pretty big red flag that something's going on there. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And emotional symptoms can include feelings of sadness, hopelessness, unhappiness, feelings of shame and guilt, and maybe also feelings of not being worthy, and really feelings of being overwhelmed. And anxiety can also play a very, a very big part in depression. I, um, they're almost like best friends sometimes, depression and anxiety, right? So, so, that's, so usually you might have feelings of anxiety as well um, when you have depression. And when you're thinking with, with, uh, depressed, with depression um, happening, you really see things with more of a negative mindset. So it's really hard to see the big picture of things or how to get out of something um, and solve a problem because you're, you're looking at everything kind of with a half glass empty kind of a view. Um, you might have trouble concentrating and paying attention, and you might have difficulty with really getting your work done. And again, that goes with you might have a, a lack of motivation now, and, and you might be feeling very, very tired, which are also some other symptoms of depression. Mm -hmm. So really, it's a mixture of things. Um, and, and, in and in college students specifically, I think it's really important to look at what, what some of the things that might be happening physically or emotionally in the college age group and what you can really spot. So if you are a professor, I think it's important to notice if somebody has stopped coming to your class or maybe they're sleeping in class when normally they wouldn't sleep. Maybe they're more hyperactive when they normally mm -hmm. were kind of quiet students. You know, maybe they wrote something on an essay that seems to be a little bit, um, you know, not the usual thing that they would write. Like all those kinds of things are important to look at, especially as a professor. And mm -hmm. as a student, as a student looking to help your peer, it's, it's similar. If you could be in class and you can see that your classmate hasn't showed up for about a week and a half or maybe two weeks and you, you're wondering what's going on there or maybe you see that they're sleeping in class or maybe they're showing up and they look like they might be high. Like there could be all sorts of things happening there that you can look, look out for each other with um, and pay attention to how someone's talking. You know, if somebody starts saying, you know, I feel kind of hopeless about this situation or I feel like there's no way out or I'm starting to feel really stressed and freaked out. Um, it would be really good to have a conversation with that person, which we're going to talk about um, in a few, a little bit later. So, um, yeah. So there's all different kinds of treatment for depression, like Erica mentioned before. Um, it's usually, yeah. Go ahead. Yes, yes, I was, yes, I was just going to ask about, you know, whether the signs and symptoms of can't, you know, I'm, I'm thinking the differences between students who are attending commuter campus, mm -hmm. you know, schools that's a, there, that's a commuter school where they show up for class, they might go to go to work. Go, go to where? I'm sorry, you cut out. Work or go home after versus students. Because I guess what I'm thinking about is for for commuter campus where I work, um, you might see the one sign, but you're not gonna you're not going to see something else. And and uh, once they're out of your classroom, they're out of your classroom. There's not a, a built-in sense of community where there are places where students can gather or or talk among each other, socialize. It's it's we do have some of that, but it's certainly not typical. Right, you're you're certainly right. You know, commuter students. Maybe students who might feel disconnected, um, such as veteran students, um, international students. You know, they they might feel like more at home when they're with you know like you know people like them. But also, it's really important that colleges consider, like you just said, having really physical spaces on campus for students to gather, having really good targeted outreach to students who might be off campus who. You know, we might not be seen all the time, right? They just come on campus for one class and then they leave right. and go on about their day. So we need to think about how we reach the various um, groups on campus and think about how we can target our, our, our programming and, and make sure that there's space and there's, a, there's spaces for them to come and, and feel heard. So important to always, those are ways that we can start recognizing symptoms if we, we have something in place for various um, um, kids on campus. And I will also add that Commuter colleges or community colleges definitely do have challenges, but residential colleges also have actually pretty similar challenges. Obviously, the main difference is a student maybe is on campus, but some of the times students live off campus for residential colleges. So, so a lot of the times the same kind of symptoms will present themselves. I think it's a matter of the school having 
um, some kind of protocols in place where they can all communicate together. So where that faculty member can really speak to counseling or the dean and let them know they're really worried about a student and see if they can contact a family member. No, whatever the case is, um, uh, that's something else to think about too. So, it's, but it's definitely a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, treatment for depression can really range. And like Erica mentioned earlier that having a combination sometimes when someone is clinically depressed of medication and talk therapy works pretty well. But there's a lot of other things that um, students can do and it's really knowing your resources on campus as well that as what can help you. A lot of the times it's finding your right formula, right, that works for you. So maybe for somebody it is therapy and medication and that works for them, but maybe for somebody, uh, somebody else it's therapy and then, you know, uh, doing meditation and doing yoga and maybe working out. So it could be a combination of things. So again, it's really important as clinicians and or if you're working with students to really look at everything holistically and see what is going on in that person's life and trying some things out that maybe uh, might be therapeutic for them that they maybe not have thought about previously. To, um, so to counseling. keep an open mind and approaches yes. is the message, right? Yes, yes, that would be very helpful, yep. Mm -hmm. So now we're really going to focus on, you know, what depression looks like in college students. We've already been doing that, but we're going to hone in a little bit deeper. Um, so, you know, for the first month, we know uh, it can be very exciting for many students when they get to college, right? They don't have to set an alarm for every morning before high school, right? They can take a class that's later in the day. They feel like they're on their own and independent. It's exciting. There's so many social events. There's a lot of things in the res hall if there is one. So it can be really fun. But, you know, what we're seeing in like the first month or two, you know, the, those wait lists and those counseling centers are really growing. So, you know, start, students start falling off. They realize they might be, you know, college is harder than high school classes. So we, they might be slipping in certain classes. You know, they, they don't really know what support is out there, that maybe there is free tutoring that exists in the Academic Resource Center. So, you know, I, it's really important to acknowledge the, the common stressors and then how we can really get to students, like a, like, a little bit more quickly than waiting a few months into the semester where people – where kids feel like their grades are dropping and, you know, all these other things sort of um, fall apart for them. So mm -hmm. some college, common college stressors, you know, transition to college, but also transitions in general for m many of us um, can lead to, to extreme thoughts of stress and, um, you know, confusion. And, you know, when people change jobs or when people move away or when, you know, just a transition in general can, can often lead to the various mood patterns. And so it's just, you know, it's very hard for when students come to college, they, they have to learn sort of a whole new community. Um, mm -hmm. So important to acknowledge, acknowledge that, that student, it's, it's, it's a new change. It's a new lifestyle. You know, many students, mm -hmm. they're, leaving, they're leaving home for the first time. So they might be experiencing feelings of homesickness. You know, it's just not the same. They, they miss their family. They miss their peers, having a high, high school buds all, the, all around all the time. You know, it's a little different college. Everybody has a different schedule. You know, you're all on your own time. So really important to note that, homesickness. Um, living with a roommate, you know, some... For many of us, you know, living with a roommate for her first time, that becomes very, can be very stressful. You have to sort of navigate, like, you know, who's going to wake up to do what and when to, you know, you have to sort of rearrange your schedule around someone else oftentimes. So just like a lot of learning that can come from that. Um, life skills. We know a lot of students are coming to college very underprepared emotionally, but also around life skills. Um, so a lot of kids, you know, don't they, they have to do laundry for the first time. They have to manage their finances. Mm -hmm. They might have their first job. So what mm -hmm. can we do as you know, professors and faculty and staff and, and colleges to really make sure there's good programming around life skills um, and so that students feel like they can navigate those? Um, you know, academics, of course, they get they're more challenging for students. Um, picking a major, you know, I know that some students like like they choose like six or so majors sometimes in their four year or five years. And so they, they extend their year past four years because they don't really know what they want to do. So that can be a stressor. Like, what do I want to do with my life? So again, there has to be a lot of work around not just transitioning to college, but how do we help students transition out of college into the workplace and feel like they, mm -hmm. they have like a future in mind? 
um, social life, navigating peer groups. Um, does a student join a club? Does a student join a sorority There's just, or a fraternity? There's so many different options, but how does one choose? That's a stressor. Um, finance, mm -hmm. again, managing for the first time. Family, um, you know, a lot of students also stay connected to their family. How do you navigate that? How do you feel connected to family, but also connected to school? Um, work, again, they might be having their first job on campus or off campus for the first time, independence, um, future plans, what am I doing with my life, and relationships, right. like, um, you know, having, you know, relationships is a key part of being, being connected to campus is a key issue. So, like, how do we help students navigate um, relationships, work on conflict management if there is a problem, and, and just sort of having those um, resources in place. So I quickly want to mention one uh, more Jed resource called Set to Go yep. that high school students and high school staff or parents and families can really utilize regarding the transition to college. So if you go to settogo.org, a whole bunch of information and resources will come up about how do I transition to college? What should I look for in a college? You know, what? How can I help myself with life skills? If I have a pre-existing um, mental health condition, how am I going to trans transition my care from high school to college? So that's a really important place to go also explore if you're interested in, in learning more about that. And all these resources Fantastic. can also be located on the JED site. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so how does one find help on campus? So there's just many ways, but we want to first acknowledge that many students are afraid to ask for help. Um, as you've probably heard your entire lives, it really doesn't hurt to ask. But sometimes students actually don't know where to go to for help. There's so many good things on campus that are available, but sometimes people don't know where to start. And just asking for help can be sort of anxiety provoking. You know, a lot of kids think that, you know, actually come feeling very resilient and they think that they, you know, may be able to handle everything that comes their way, but we know that there are things that are going to hit you and there, you know, you're going to want to be able to reach out if, if things um, progress and worsen. Um, so some things that students can start off by doing is um, they can speak to a professor during office hours if they're maybe struggling with academics. You know, we also know from studies that um, students are going to rely and go to their peers before adults. So um, just it's important to also have a trusted adult, like a faculty or an advisor, but we also know students are going to go to their friends and they might mm -hmm. tell them like, what's going on with them. So we really want to think about how we can um, enhance training for peers and young adults as well as, you know, the professors and the, the staff on campus. Um, there's also mm -hmm. so many other resources on campus, such as student affairs, um, you know, student life, campus health, the counseling center. Res halls, you know, a lot of RAs are really well trained to like help help students who are living in the res halls and um, navigate with their life stressors. So it's really it's good to use RAs to the best, you know, as much as people can because they're they're the support, they're like the advisor always around. Um, and then there's student disability services, and there's a lot of academic accommodations that many schools have in place. Tutoring, study skills, test anxiety, um, needing more time on tests, it's important to look into those. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we know with wait lists on, in counseling centers and sometimes counseling centers have certain scope of practices that they look for in a student. Um, so we know off-campus resources can be super helpful. So. A lot of college, most colleges and universities have a list of outside referral options, like their go-to people that they refer students. So important mm -hmm. to think about and ask if those are available and if someone either can help you navigate those or if you can, you know, students also can call themselves um, for, for assistance outside of college. So there's just so many good things on campus and often can be located on the college website. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah. You will go ahead. be getting into this a little bit later on, but um, what can friends do if students do ask friends for help or they indicate to a friend that they are struggling or a professor for that for that matter? Yeah. What can they do? Say, yeah. Um, so I'm going to go into that right now, actually. Next slide. Um, okay. So we have, we have this new campaign called Seize the Awkward, and it's really about um, what can friends do um, around help giving and help receiving. Um, so there's so many ways to identify. We, we just talked about all the signs and symptoms we can look at in ourselves and other people, but 
how do you really think about what's in others around signs of depression? So what, what this campaign is, is meant for is talking to a friend about their mental health can be awkward, but it can be really help. So we know that it's very awkward to say, how's it going? How are you today? You don't, you don't seem yourself. Is there any way I can help? And a lot of people fear that if they ask these questions and it's going to make it worse. Like if we mm -hmm. ask, these questions about suicide, people fear that it's going to put it more into their head. But that's mm -hmm. actually not true. We have to really understand and read, read the data that it, it's actually not true. I think the more we reach out and ask those important questions, just checking in with a friend when we think that something doesn't look right, um, it's going to do more than, like, do really good work, you know, things for that student and hopefully get them the help they need. So um, it really doesn't matter how someone asks. It, it just matters that someone does. So this campaign, if you go to the website, has awesome videos and content, conversation starters, ways that like peers can help peers, and it just it's just very targeted to the youth. Um, so really a good resource to check out. And I, I also just want to uh, jump jump on quickly what Erica said that you know. It doesn't matter how you ask, you just do. You know, countless times I've heard from students and people I've worked with that once somebody opened the door for them or the window a little bit to talk about these these issues they were mm -hmm. having, the relief mm -hmm. the relief that they felt of carrying this alone, like it lifted incredibly. Um, because oh, lots of times God. they don't want to bring it up and they don't want to be a burden to somebody else with what they're through, but if you can open up that door slightly, it could really make the difference between somebody getting help and really improving their life. Yeah, and, and you know, something also to note, we, we all don't have to have all the answers, and we actually don't always have the answers on how to help someone. But even if we just can start one piece of the conversation, how's it going? You seem off today. I'm worried about you. Stuff like that. It's, mm -hmm. again, open the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then we can lean on the good resources and support out there, such as referring to the, uh, you know, a professional, a, you know, a mental health professional, or helping that person get the help they need. So we have to also recognize that we're all human, and we mm -hmm. might not know all the answers, but it's it's, it's okay. But it's it's the, this this campaign is so powerful because it really just suggests it's it's what you do. It's not how you ask. Yeah. So really just I like love the title. It's awkward. Yeah, it's it's so great. Yeah, it's very helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So again, these are five ways to start a conversation. We just wanted to shed light on them. Um. I, I talked about it earlier, but you know, just some things. Are you okay? You don't seem like yourself. Seems like something's up. Do you want to talk about it? Um. I'm worried about you. Um. Would like to help. So. Um. Again, people can find out how to help a friend, and not just a friend. You can think about how to help a colleague. Right. You can help a, you know, a stranger on the street. You know, we we all have the capacity to have these conversations. We just need that like little push to know that you know we we have the confidence to do so. And I imagine for some people, it, it might take one or two tries of starting a conversation. Maybe three tries. Mm -hmm. First time, you might get no, I'm okay. Okay, I'm fine. Don't worry. But then after a couple more times of presenting with uh, you know, their concern and why they're concerned, then they'd be more willing to go into it, knowing that you're, you're there, you're not afraid to ask. And, and that, 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 is, that is, uh, can be, be reassuring for the student who's suffering. Right. And just saying that you're there for the person, even if they don't want to talk, like that you're willing to sit in the room in silence, that's, that's sometimes yeah. good enough. So that's good. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're uh, going to jump into a little bit more about what we see some of our JET campus schools doing um, to help with depression on campus or help with their students. And maybe that can also give some ideas that you can do in your own community, your family, right, or with your friends or mm -hmm. uh, in a college campus. Uh, but before we jump into that, just a little bit more background about what a JET campus does. And I think it's helpful to kind of know what they do. So when they join up into our JET campus program, and what happens is it becomes a four-year collaboration between JET and then key stakeholders across that campus community. So the, one of the very first things we do with the JET school is form a campus-wide team that's made up of not just counseling and health, but made up of security and legal and communications and career services, maybe admissions, um, residence life, so a whole slew of people from different departments on campus. 
and people that are very invested in doing the work for protecting the emotional health and well-being of their students. So usually also the president is involved or the provost or um, vice president as well. So I think it's important that um, people take that, you know, public health approach on the college campus. So what we do then at that point is we give, we give schools an in-depth self-assessment. They do the assessment. We have an in-depth campus visit with them. And from that point on, we create a strategic plan with the school to really work on a systems level, what they can do for their students to improve the, their well-being on campus. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll work for them then for four years to really implement different changes on campus. And at a three-year point, they'll get a post-assessment where they see what changes they have made and see what, you know, um, might be happening at the end of that four years that they could still kind of work on. So it's pretty in depth. Um, if you want to see the schools that are JED Campus schools, you can go onto our JED Campus website, jedcampus.org, mm -hmm. and you can take a look to see what schools are JED Campuses. Um, and if you ever want to, you know, see one of your schools go through it, you can always contact us as well to talk more about it. So mm -hmm. that's wonderful. Yeah, so a little bit about what we're learning as campus advisors. So we are, again, that direct contact um, to our leaders at schools that are working on these initiatives. So a little bit about what JED campuses are doing to really help with, um, to help with decreasing symptoms of depression and anxiety, but also embracing connectedness on campus and help-seeking behavior. So a little bit of what we're doing is um, we're really encouraging schools to think about doing really good campaigns around um, help seeking and destigmatization. So a campaign could look like that Seize the Awkward um, video that you, you might check out later um, around, you know, really streaming it across campus so that there's a presence and people can see it in public areas on campus like the Student Center. So really getting out the word that it's really that maybe that college is, is a culture of caring and they really, you know, care about their students and it's really important to seek help when needed and to really destigmatize mental health issues. So some of our, our schools are having their own students create videos and social media campaigns, mm -hmm. like, like infographics and things like that around how do we destigmatize mental health? How do we make it normal to feel the way we feel and to reach out for help when needed? And where are the resources on campus? So just like sort of these overall broad campaigns are super helpful, effective. And if they come from students and they're student-led, student-facilitated and driven, that's where students are going to see it, right? We know that students are going to listen to students over adults. So we really want them to be engaged in the process. Um, in addition, you know, support groups are really important. A lot of schools have, you know, spaces on campus for students to gather to talk about symptoms, to talk about how they're feeling, and to engage with a professional staff member around, you know, where to find help and how to how to lean on others who are also feeling the same way they do. Um, again, important to have spaces to gather for other um, things happening, um, like, you know, an eating disorder support group, uh, you know, tr transitioning to college support group. There's so many different, you know, things, like uh, how to build confidence support group. There's so many different ways and avenues to build workshops and resources for students. Additionally, there's a lot of, like, student-led and driven groups on campus, such as Active Minds, um, mm -hmm. AMI on campus, and um, peer mentoring and peer education programs are really um, important, a uh, good way for peers to rely on one another and give resources and support in education. Um, thirdly, you know, so gatekeeper training is a big piece of what we do and um, really ties into the Seize the Awkward, but really having a training in place for faculty, staff, and students to know the signs of when str someone's struggling, you know, know, know how to identify it, um, really know how to have a conversation, you know, how, what, what do we say, what, again, what, what, when do we notice someone is down or off, um, and how do we refer? So it's really important that schools start thinking about um, collaboratively how to build gatekeeper trainings. There's some for purchase that um, we have resources on. But there, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. schools can create their own, you know, because we know mm -hmm. what a coach sees in athletes might be different than what a faculty member sees in their students in math class. Right. So we, we want to really make sure that some of these trainings are targeted and that people are really mm -hmm. honing in on, you know, what students are really struggling with in their realm of life on campus and how we can support them and, and know the signs and refer. 
Um, in addition, you know, there's, there are screening days. Um, so we know uh, many students are online and on their phone. So we encourage screening days both online, on their phone, and in person. And we want to make sure they're campus-wide. So some of our schools um, engage, like, for example, Greek life or athletic coaches to screen for mental health in their students, in particular their athletes or their, their fraternity or sorority organizations. Um, so really making a campus-wide approach because many, all people can really screen for mental health. You don't necessarily need a clinician to be on the other end. It's important to know where to refer, but many of us can ask the questions, you know, are you feeling down? Um, how many days have you felt depressed? But it's, 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 it's again, knowing the research campus. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, in around campaigns, you know, a good example is some schools are doing our resiliency building campaigns. You know, again, we know students come with some type of resiliency, but really embracing that and acknowledging that students like have the strength to like power through and, and know where to seek help and know how to get help for themselves. But um, one of our schools, for example, did a really neat poster campaign around um, adulting. So saying adulting is hard, and here's what you can do. Like, for example, you can mm -hmm. find your meaning and purpose. You can cultivate meaningful relationships through connectedness. Um, some mm -hmm. things are beyond our control. We, we know that as adults. So really um, publicizing these campaigns and, and shedding light on that we're all human and we all have things that we go through, but there's, there's help that we can, you know, find in the support around campus. Mm -hmm. Now and I have a question I, for you. Yeah, okay. This is mostly, I'm sorry, this is mostly around mm -hmm. uh, building a very supportive campus, destigmatizing mm -hmm. have mental health issues and uh, creating almost like a, a infrastructure for students. Um, I think this, this is wonderful. Is there also a component where parents or families are involved? I know they're, they're adults technically, but yet they're mm -hmm. not all really adult, as you said, adulting is, can be very difficult. And um, where and I know that there are laws that prevent um, families from getting access to, I guess, health health information, even uh, certain information about students, like FERPA, for instance. So, do you see uh, where uh -huh. families can intervene, or, or or can I guess intersect, I guess, around the help of depressed with depressed students? Yeah, so we we encourage schools to always make sure that they're speaking with parents and families um, in the sense of, yes, now a student is under FERPA, so you can't really speak about too much, but in the sense of making sure families and parents know about the existing resources on mm -hmm. campus, know about the trends that that school is seeing on campus, um, know that maybe, hey, it's around finals, maybe make sure to reach out to your student, to see, make sure they understand what happens if they're drinking too much and all those kinds of things. Um, so it's really keeping a dialogue with the parents open. Now, when it comes to FERPA and, you know, getting counseling services, a student can give consent to have their parents involved uh, in treatment, but it is on the student most of the time. So what will happen regardless if a student is in um, crisis, you know, if a, if a counselor notices that a mm -hmm. student really is suicidal or homicidal, all that goes out of the window and families get called and contacted. So I think that's also important for families to understand as well. Um, and part of resiliency and helping mm -hmm. your student thrive is also giving them the autonomy to make decisions and understand what works best for them. So there is a fine line with families and parents, I think. But I think if you work together with the school to know where does communication mm -hmm. end and what we do to really help my student on your campus. I think that um, that's very helpful. There and there, there are a lot of schools that have parent and family offices, and they have also advocacy, parent and family advocacy groups where parents can talk to each other and build their own kind of community as well. Which I think, if if your school has that, I think that's also a very helpful thing. Um, but I think being open-minded mm -hmm. with your college student is very helpful, and to uh, let them come to you and talk to you and maybe ask them some of the hard questions like, hey, I noticed you are very depressed and not yourself, and maybe giving them that conversation to start is also helpful as well, but um, do know that schools are also trying to do as much as they can for your student. I think that's good to know. So I, don't, I, hope, that, I hope that answers mm -hmm. your question. <laughs> so. Yes, yes, it, it, it's, it's a delicate balance to, I guess, it's a, a balancing act, right? 
uh, because they're they're at, they're at an age where they are adults. But during if there's a crisis or an emergency situation, parents uh, can be involved. I imagine many parents are nervous about sending their kids to school, especially if they have pre-existing mental health conditions and, and not having any information about them once they're out of the house. We, we also have a guide called Starting the Conversation that we wrote with NAMI about that, actually that exact thing, you know, what can mm-hmm. families and parents do with the transition to college, if, and especially mm-hmm. if there's a pre-existing mm-hmm. mental health right. condition. So that might, that might be something that might be useful to some folks. Um, if you go to our JED resources on JED, at the jedfoundation.org website, you can find it there. It's called Starting the Conversation. Um, and that might be, mm-hmm. that might have some helpful tips. Mm-hmm. And it also discusses uh, FERPA and HIPAA and what you can expect once they're out of the household, basically. Um, so. Mm-hmm. Great. Okay, so, so how can you help? <laughs> so we've kind of gone through all these things um, and we thought it might be helpful to leave, leave uh, folks with some ideas of how they can be helpful with themselves, with others and, and whatnot. So there's a whole lot of ways that you can obviously help, but some suggestions are um, really one of the main things is if your gut feels like something's off with somebody, whether it's a loved one or somebody in your class, you know, really kind of go there and ask the questions and see what's going on. So it's very important to pay attention to how you're feeling, (laughs) right, surrounding how somebody's acting. So Mm -hmm. I always... I think it's good to err on the side of if something is at like 51%, you're noticing like something's a little bit halfway not right, then definitely ask a question. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's that's definitely a pretty important thing that you can do. Another thing is be familiar with your local resources, whether it's in the college community or whether it's in your local community, to know where can you refer someone once you do reach out and talk to them. Um, And make sure that you have those hotline numbers in your phone. So... We, we always work with, um, with the crisis text line, which I believe is 741-741, and you would text that number, and it's free, and all you write is talk, and then right away, there's a counselor that's trained to start talking with you via text. Um, the mm-hmm. National, Suicide, mm-hmm. National Suicide Prevention Hotline is very important, which is also, I believe, 1-800-273-TALK, and there's also a trained professional 24-7 at that point as well, so I think it's good to arm yourselves, right, with these kind of tools for yourself and for folks that might need it that you can always refer to in your phone. I think it's also good to put in your phone just even the local resources numbers. Mm -hmm. If you have a local therapist that you know is really good or, Mm -hmm. you know, a local community center or on college for college students to put the counseling center number in their phone or put the hotline number on the college campus in their phone. Like these little things I think are helpful because in the moment, You might be feeling good, but when you are feeling very depressed, you can just now go to your phone and call um, or download the college app, those kinds of things. So um, another thing that's very helpful. That's a very good idea. Yeah. Um, We also think it's helpful if everyone gets trained, you know, and what to do and how to handle somebody who might be very depressed um, or even feeling suicidal. So There are mental health first aid trainings offered nationwide that you can Google and see if there's something happening in your local town or even on your college campus. Sometimes they're offering this. Um, That's recommended. You can also get trained in QPR. So that's a Q and then a P as in Peter and R as in rainbow. Um, So if you Google that as well, Mm -hmm. there are trainings nationwide that you can go to. And also maybe just also talking to another trained professional about Giving, getting some advice on their level about what to do in a certain situation is helpful. Um, mm-hmm. so that's, that's another suggestion. And we also have a ton of resources. On our next slide, we have them up here. Here they are, <laughs> that you can go to. So again, I think it's important to remember you're not alone in this, right? There's a lot of folks that want to help. There's a lot of people mm-hmm. who have done research and who are, who are experts in certain areas of the field. So know to go to these websites and look at all the slew of information that are that are on these websites that you can really use to help you and help someone else. I think that's also something to think about as well. So, so yeah. So. <laughs> thank you so much for yeah. the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Thank you both.
Thank you for both Erica and Diana. This has been so so wonderful to realize that there, there's a lot of help out there for students who are just beginning their college career. It would be a very taxing time, I, and, and I'm sure our viewers and our, uh, our audience members would uh, benefit greatly from all these resources. So I appreciate your time. And um, so let me uh, go ahead and wrap up uh, this presentation. Again, thank you to both uh, presenters for a wonderful presentation. Um, and you can also um, just change this into a slide show here. You can also send email questions. I know there were a lot of resources, some of which you may have missed uh, when um, Diana and Erica um, mentioned throughout the webinar. So if there are some specific questions, just put email webinars at adaa.org on the subject line, put depression, and uh, feel free to write questions, and uh, questions and answers will be posted on, on an ongoing basis on our webinar website page. So uh, once again, thank you, and um, we will see you again in future right. webinars. Thank, thank you, you very much. Tommy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.